Okay, it is August 28th and I am officially calling it. If I manage to read any more in the month of April, I'm just throwing it into my May wrap up. So this is going to be my official reading wrap up of April, 2023. This has been a very strange reading month for me because I've been hesitant this entire time to call it a reading slump because I have been reading, but just at a much slower pace than what I'm used to. I think it's because I've really struggled with audiobooks recently. I don't know what it is, but I haven't been able to pick up an audio book and have it keep my attention in a really long time. Something up here is just not clicking with audiobooks recently. So it has definitely slowed down my reading pace. So literally all of my books this month were either physical or ebooks. So I think only one of them was an ebook. Fully. Overall, I was able to read five books in April. Again, I don't know why I'm so hesitant to call this a reading slump because normally I read anywhere from like 10 to 15 books in a month. This month I read five. So definitely a slump happening. However, these five books were really good. Um, like I rated them really highly. I enjoyed them, but I went through them at a much slower pace. Not a bad thing, definitely not a bad thing, especially since the books that I was reading are slower paced. I think it made sense. So let's just start with the very first book that I read this month. Let me put these down. So the very first book that I read this month was Defect by Nino Supri, and this is a part of like a standalone sci-fi series. I'm not gonna say too much about the plot of this story, but compared to that is my mailman who is, okay, hold on. <laughs> I have a feeling he just dropped off one of my book packages, so let me just check on that real quick. Um, is anyone surprised that it's from bookshop.org? I'm not. I think I put... I know what it is. I ordered like three books in three days, all from bookshop.org, and I wasn't sure what order they were going to come in. I, I think I lied to you. I think I lied to you when I said that I probably wasn't going to be able to finish any more books before the end of this month. Um, it's April 28th right now, and my copy of Happy Place is here. Ugh. You know, I was a little upset that it was coming in hardback, but, well, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing right now and read this right now. I'm certainly not going to do that. Personally, um, Beach Read is my favorite Emily Henry book as of right now. I think it goes like beach read, book lovers, the people we meet on vacation. My biggest gripe with people we meet on vacation is that it shouldn't be titled the people we meet on vacation because it's not about the people that they meet on vacation, but I've digressed. I'm really excited to see where this ranks within my Emily Henry ranking that I currently have just because Every single person that has talked about this book so far has mentioned that it's sad. It is a sad, sad, sad book with like a hint of romance. And that is honestly my perfect like description of a romance book. Like that's my absolute favorite, which is why Beach Read is so highly rated for me personally. So I'm very excited to see how this ranks because I think it has a lot of potential and I will be diving into this. Like all of these characters here, I will be diving in as soon as I'm done filming this. I'm reading this just so that you're aware. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to put this in the same video. I got totally sidetracked. <sighs> okay. Okay, so the first book that I read in April was Defect by Nino Supri. This is actually the only like ebook that I fully read in this month. And I say fully because I kind of dipped in and out of one later. I'll get to that later. But Defect is the second book in a standalone sci-fi series. I read the first book, Finna, back in March for the Trans Rights Readathon. And it was really interesting. It was focused on two different characters that are employees at Littenverse. Littenverse is like this world's Ikea. So this Ikea is basically like a hot spot for multi-dimensional portals. And occasionally like customers will accidentally wander through these portals and it'll be these like underpaid employees job to go and like retrieve the customers and bring them back with this like Finna device. So that story follows like two exes who have to go into these portals together and retrieve a customer. It has a like, the series in general has a lot to say about capitalism and the commentary is spot on. However, that book for me kind of got lost in a lot of the different like jumps between places. I wasn't able to follow along as clearly as I was hoping to. So for me, Finna was like a three out of five star, but I was still really interested in whatever the second book was going to entail. And when I picked up Defect, I wasn't 
aware that it was a standalone series. I thought we were following the original characters in like a second book, but this actually is completely separate. It follows a different employee at Littenverse. Derek is what they call a very special employee. He's like a top tier employee. And the entire time like Derek knows he's different, but he doesn't know why. And so like, we don't know what Derek is and Derek doesn't know what Derek is. Derek is just deeply, deeply unhappy. And I kind of connected with him immediately. Like I just really felt for this character almost right off the bat. But like, we don't know what Derek is and Derek doesn't know what Derek is. So everyone's just gonna figure it out together. But one day Derek just gets signed up for the night shift. And I don't wanna give too much away, but the second book is focused on the store. They're not jumping through portals as often. It's more along the lines of things coming through the portals and the impact that the portals have on the store itself than jumping through the portals. So I felt like it was a much more solid story. So for me, this book was a five star read that I absolutely loved. I was able to so clearly visualize absolutely everything that was happening. And there were certain moments that were very heavy and emotional, but they were paired with this like comedic element of what was happening in the store. And through it all, it has those themes of acceptance, capitalism, and a lot of other heavy themes that are carried throughout the story that I think are done really well. I would highly, highly recommend this one. Again, I thought it was five stars. I could see this being adapted into like a TV show or a movie really, really easily, and it would be highly entertaining. I would absolutely watch it. And then honestly, I kind of took a break from reading for a while. I don't entirely know how to describe to you what was going through my brain as that was happening, but like nothing sounded like something I wanted to pick up fresh. So I actually went back to a book that I had already started, knew that I liked, but just put down for other priority items. And that was Thistlefoot. Now I already spoke quite a bit about Thistlefoot in my reading vlog that I did in April. I do think that Thistlefoot was a really good book for me to pick for this month specifically, just because while it again was heavier, it was also a slower pace and I was able to digest it in pieces. Also, I just think it's like really interesting that Lemony Snicket actually blurbed this one. If you read a series of unfortunate events as a child, I feel like you would understand why Thistlefoot and Lemony Snicket, to me, in my brain, they go together. Like there's this like whimsical element to this story that I think fits really well. But Thistlefoot is a Baba Yaga. Did I say it right this time? I said it wrong last time. This is a Baba Yaga retelling, but instead of focusing on Baba Yaga, it focuses on her descendants who are brother and sister, and they inherit this house on chicken legs. And with this house on chicken legs, they decide to go on tour with like their puppet show. But the entire time, this shadow man is chasing them down and trying to find the house on chicken legs. This is slower paced. It's very verbose. It's very lyrical. I personally really enjoyed it, but if those descriptors don't sound like something you'd enjoy, you probably should skip this one. But I loved this. Though to be fair, again, I would highly, highly encourage you to check any and all trigger warnings. Here are the ones that I can put up here. I cried for the last 200 pages at this story. I was unwell. My husband was sitting next to me and just like very concerned the entire time. I think one of my favorite things about this story though is the way that it is written. Not only is it it lyrical, but we also get chapters that are from the house's perspective. The house is a personality within this story. And the house is the one that links back the history of Baba Yaga to her descendants. I think this was really well done. And then keeping with the slower paced theme, I decided to dip into some classics after finishing Thistlefoot. I can't entirely tell you why my brain decided that classics was the way to go. Um, but I had ordered some off of bookshop.org and I decided this was the perfect time to get into them. And I started with The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Somehow I managed to skip this book in all of my high school English classes. So I was reading this one fresh, though I was told that it was one of like the queerest classics and I get it. Honestly, right off the bat, I was absolutely losing my mind over Basil's feelings and thoughts of Dorian. And even though Basil's feelings felt very surface level, at least for me, like it felt like he was in love with the visage of Dorian. He was in love with painting Dorian. 
his emotions behind those feelings were making me lose my actual mind. And as I was reading this and going back and forth between like the text and the annotations where it shows like what pieces were edited out of the text, I was just thinking the entire time that like me and this editor had problems. Me and this editor, we were fighting. I'm sure there were so many reasons as to why those things were taken out. And the fact that Oscar Wilde was literally imprisoned for a few years because of a male lover, um, part of it could have been for his protection, but me and the editor are fighting. <laughs> but the way that in the very beginning, Basil worships Dorian and the way he expresses how he worships Dorian, immaculate, absolutely immaculate, no notes. And just like the added context of what was happening at the time and Oscar Wilde's life, there were certain elements of Basil that I couldn't help equating. Like when he said, oh, I can't explain it. When I like people immensely, I never tell their names to anyone. It's like surrendering a part of them. I have grown to love secrecy. Mm, yeah, you have to. And with the added context of the entire reason Basil doesn't want to exhibit his portrait of Dorian Gray, being that he put too much of himself into his work. Oscar, I hear you. One of the very first instances that stood out to me on the differences between what was written in the text and what was edited out was on page 12 where Basil says, every day, I couldn't be happy if I didn't see him every day. He is absolutely necessary to me. And if that wasn't bad enough, what they had edited out said, of course, sometimes it's only for a few minutes, but a few minutes with somebody one worships mean a great deal, but you don't really worship him. I do. And every reference to an extraordinary romance. Ugh. Okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. Rip my heart out. My actual annotation here was I'm gasping, play false god and go feral. But again, I had no idea where we were going with this. And I wasn't entirely sure what to make of a book that was described as like a horror in a classic sense. I didn't know where we were going with this, but I knew that Lord Henry's influence on Dorian was going to be the pivotal like kickoff of it all. And like Lord Henry was just smart enough and bored enough to exert that influence in whatever way he thought was going to be the most entertaining and like manipulate the situation, which is why I found it so interesting that when you start to see the shift of Dorian, he's constantly referencing what he thinks Henry would say or what he thinks Henry would do or want him to do. But for a significant period of time, dialogue is completely missing from the text and it's all just internal Dorian thoughts. And Henry's influence is still so clearly there. Now there was a significant portion of that point of time where Dorian isn't actually speaking to anyone. You can literally see him in the text removing himself from what he's doing from these cruel acts that are affecting his painting. And I'm fairly certain that in the annotations it mentions that all of these distractions for Dorian were added in after the fact, which like, I personally got tired of. I wanted to get back into what was going to happen, but it did kind of like, there was this buildup of something big's gonna happen. Suspense, hold. For me, it held a little too long, but then wow, that ending. I'm not gonna say anything, because if you were like me and you haven't read this, I'm not gonna spoil it because I was surprised. I hadn't had it spoiled for me and I had a great time reading this. Again, it's not like the fastest paced book. I would actually say this is medium paced and for a classic, one of the faster ones that I've ever read, but I digested this in pieces. I didn't just blow through it in one like binge read and I really loved it. I still have to like go through and tab and index everything. So I will probably do that in my next reading vlog, but I had such a good time with this book. There is so much to think about here. I will 100% be doing a reread at some point in time. Five stars. From there, I just decided to keep going with the classics and I picked up Pride and Prejudice. I wasn't sure what kind of a romance I wanted to do next, but I knew I wanted to do a romance and I tried a couple rom-coms that were on my TBR cart and nothing felt right. And then I looked up at this part of my shelf and I was like, oh, I know what I need. 
I know what I need and it's Pride and Prejudice. However, shortly after starting the cloth bound classic version of Pride and Prejudice, I realized that I actually was getting like heavily distracted by the way this book felt in my hands. I've read these cloth bound classics before. Obviously I have a few of them up here. This, like the width of this one specifically, it just like dug into my hands in the worst way. It felt very aggressive. And I am a paperback person, but at the same time, this felt like the most hardback book that could ever hardback. And it was hardbacking at me in an aggressive manner. So I almost immediately bought the paperback version of this. However, I was finished with this book by the time the paperback came in, which is totally fine. That just means that I will be annotating the paperback version. I specifically haven't been annotating my Clothbound Classic versions. I love annotating and I'll annotate a hardback book. I did it with Thistlefoot, but something about like a limited edition, it just like didn't feel right. Um, so I'll be having a grand old time at some point in the near future doing a reread of Pride and Prejudice, annotating it to my little heart's desire, and having a nice floppy book in my hand throughout it all. I'm very much so looking forward to it. Obviously I had like watched the movies Pride and Prejudice before, but I hadn't actually sat down and like read it cover to cover yet. I had a great time. I had a great time. Again, a slower paced read that I was able to digest over a period of time. I didn't binge through anything. This is a very weird month for me in that respect, but I had a, such a good time with this. Another five stars. This was a great time. I think I do need to watch the movie again though, because mm, I haven't stopped thinking about hands. <laughs> But because this book actually didn't come in until after I was already done reading, I, that doesn't actually mean that I finished reading it with this hardback version. I actually borrowed the ebook from my library and I read it that way because this was so aggravating to me. So beautiful. Looks so good on my shelf. Just doesn't feel right. And then the last book that I read was Sunny Disposition. This is a Kindle Unlimited hockey romance. It is grumpy sunshine. It is just about everything that I love in a rom-com. And honestly, hockey romance is one of those genres that I go back to when I am in a book slump. So like, it's not super surprising that I made my way there this month. And honestly, this one was just so good. It is a college hockey romance. It follows Naomi and Finn. Finn is a hockey player, obviously. And Naomi is kind of finding her way through life, but she is an online streamer. She does it anonymously. And Finn is actually one of her moderators, which is how they initially met and became like online friends. They had never actually met in real life, never had done any sort of video calling or anything. And they had this plan to meet up. They were really feeling each other. Like they definitely thought that like a relationship could happen. But that same night Finn had a hockey game. And after the game, he ended up getting like jumped by some of the team members of the team that they were playing. He was hospitalized. He was in a coma. He had lost almost all of his memories. So he misses the meetup with Naomi. And the book kind of goes from there. There's a lot of forced proximity here because they actually end up like unknowingly become roommates. And I loved the way that the grumpy sunshine dynamic was at play here, specifically because Naomi very clearly within the text was struggling with a lot of really heavy things and had at multiple times didn't allow herself to feel negative emotions because she thought she always needed to be this like sunshine human. So Finn in his grumpiness because let's be fair like he had a lot to be grumpy about but it seemed like that was kind of like in his nature to begin with but he helps her fully be able to embrace all of her emotions to the point where like when she does inevitably get mad at him he hears her and then after they've talked about it he says i'm proud of you i'm proud of you for owning your anger and expressing it to me Highly recommend, highly recommend. It was just such a good time. I am definitely going to get into book two at some point in time. However, I think that's going to be on pause until I read Happy Place. I don't really do monthly TBRs, but I can absolutely tell you that Happy Place is going to be one of the next books that I read, along with the second book in the Sunny Disposition series. And from there, I'm just as clueless as you are. I have quite a few books on this TBR cart that I need to get through though, because it is jam-packed. Just looking at my reading journal and I actually did not get to any of the books that I had noted as priority TBR items. 
um, on my reading journal. So all of those are gonna get moved into May. I do actually have a buddy read lined up in May with my friends. It's kind of like unofficial. We just like text back and forth together while we are reading books. And we read What Lies Beyond the Veil and What Hunts Beyond the Shadow together. And these are hate reads for us. Like we get together and read these books and talk about how much we hate them. And <laughs> that sounds kind of crazy, but the third book came out and she was like, so you're reading this with me, right? And I couldn't say no. So at some point in May, we will be picking that up together and going through that. I'm hoping beyond hope, this third book is better than the second, but I also found out that there's actually gonna be a fourth book in this series, which is just gonna be insane because the second book, like the entire thing was just the fact that like none of the characters wanted any information. So they were just going along clueless, even though like the answers were right there the entire time, they just didn't want them. I'm really hoping that this third book doesn't follow suit, but we shall see. So May is just already shaping up to be a very interesting reading month for me. Um, my next video is most likely going to be another reading vlog where I do my annotations for The Picture of Dorian Gray as well as Pride and Prejudice. So go ahead and subscribe if you're not already so that you can get notified when that video comes out. While you're there, you might as well like this video. And I would love to hear what your favorite read of April was. Clearly, I'm always looking to expand my TBR. So if you absolutely love something, let me know. But if you are still here with me watching this video, thank you so much for being here today. I hope you have a beautiful, beautiful day. See you next time.